All right. Good to see you here this evening. Welcome to the Good Wednesday service. Amen. I asked Mrs. Taylor to come and sing a song tonight. I want you to listen very carefully. I've asked her to sing it a cappella, and I've asked her to sing it very deliberately. I want you to really listen to the words that really, we're going to speak in a few minutes about the sufferings of Christ on the cross, and uh, this kind of tells the story. It's familiar to you, but still think about the words as she sings them tonight, and ask God to minister to your heart, all right? They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, he's to blame. He 
could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone for you and me. Upon his precious head they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the king. They cursed him and they struck him and they mocked his holy name all alone he suffered everything when they nailed him to the cross his mother stood nearby he said woman behold thy son. He cried, I thirst for water, but they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone for you and me. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. He cried, it is finished, and gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels but he died alone for you and me. Yes, he died alone for you and me. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Take your Bible this evening, if you would, and turn with me to Matthew 27, please. Matthew chapter 27. Look with me, please, at verse number 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall, and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him, and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him, and took the reed, and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him 
put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. And as they came, as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull. They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple, and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lamas sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard it said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. And Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Now, Father, I pray that you would help us this evening in our mind's eye to go back to Calvary, to go back even before Calvary and help us this evening, Lord, to focus our attention on the sufferings of Jesus Christ. I feel that we don't often understand the blackness and the, the wrongness of sin unless we focus on what it cost your dear son to pay for our sin debt. And so, Father, help each one of us tonight for these next few minutes to walk with Jesus through his time of suffering. May it impact our lives for your glory and for our good, in Jesus' name, amen. In the middle of the night, Judas came with the soldiers to the garden. He betrays Jesus with a kiss. They arrest Jesus, and he is led to the Sanhedrin and to Caiaphas, the high priest. A soldier struck Jesus across the face for remaining silent when he was questioned by Caiaphas. Palace guards then blindfolded him and taunted him to identify them as they passed by and struck him in the face or spat in his face. Understand it's now the wee hours of the morning on a Wednesday. Jesus is tired. He's battered, he's bruised, he's dehydrated. He's been up for over 24 hours now. He's taken across the city to the praetorium to face Pilate. 
And there, in response to the people's request, he releases Barabbas, a known murderer, and condemns Jesus to scourging and crucifixion. We'll talk about Jesus' suffering on the cross, but you know, Jesus suffered before the crucifixion. The Roman law dictated that before the condemned person would be crucified, they had to first be scourged. Scourging or flogging was a terrible thing to endure. The prisoner is stripped of his clothing. His hands are tied to a post above his head. A Roman soldier then steps up with the scourge to begin the whipping. The scourge itself is a tool with a wooden handle and strips of leather attached to it. On those strips of leather are pieces of bone and metal and lead balls embedded into the leather strips. The victim was fastened to a low post so that his back would be stretched And the Roman soldier administering the scourge was trained to rake the scouring tool across the back of the victim and rip the skin from his back. As the blows would continue cutting deeper into the sub-tissues, it would produce oozing blood from the capillaries and veins, which after repeated blows became spurting blood from the vessels and eventually exposing even the internal organs. These soldiers were hardened men who could take a person to the brink of death before relenting. The skin of the back is now hanging in long ribbons. The entire, the entire area is unrecognizable, has a mass of torn and bleeding tissue. You see, Jesus endured suffering before he ever got to the cross. Then the soldiers did something else. The songwriter was kind when he said they placed a crown of thorns upon his head. They actually beat a crown of thorns into his head. Not small thorns, probably thorns that were around 12 inches in length. And then they proceeded to slap Jesus around and to mock him. And it's interesting that Pilate turned a blind eye to all of these activities. He was hoping to gain some sympathy for Jesus and possibly release him. He figured the more pathetic Jesus appeared, maybe the more possibility the people would feel sorry for him and want to let him go. But Jesus never fought back. He never retaliated. Isaiah 50 and verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Luke 24, 7, Jesus said, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. The suffering of Jesus represents God's disdain for sin. The Bible says in John 19, they delivered him up, therefore, to be crucified. And they led Jesus away, and he, bearing his cross, went forth to a place called the place of a skull, which in the Hebrew is Golgotha. But I'd like you to know he suffered not only before the crucifixion, he suffered on his way to the crucifixion. He faced the the scourging, the beating, the mocking, And now he has to carry his own cross. The typical procession that took the final journey with the condemned man consisted of a centurion on horseback and then a herald who would proclaim the sentence as well as why the condemned man was about to die. Then the condemned... And then behind him, a small company of four soldiers. And throughout the trip, hearing the taunts and the jeers of the crowd, their ridicule. That rough hewn beam of wood is tied across his shoulders. 
And with two other condemned men, they began the slow 650-yard journey to Golgotha. But the weight of the wood beam, the loss of blood, the lack of sleep proved to be too much. Jesus stumbles and falls. The rough wood gouging his lacerated skin. He tries to rise, but the muscles have been pushed beyond their limit. So they compel one in the crowd, Simon, to carry his cross. You know, Luke 23, 26 tells us that Jesus was not able to carry that cross by himself. I think not only the beating and the wood on his raw back, but I believe he was feeling the load of our sin upon him as well. Can you imagine if you were God watching your son suffer? Watching him make that walk? Think about when we endure suffering. How often do we get angry with God? Why didn't God stop this injustice? Why, why didn't He stop this from happening to me? It's not fair is what we think in our mind. I mean, if God were a loving God, wouldn't want me to suffer. Hmm. But God allows Jesus to suffer. Because that's what's required for God's justice to be satisfied for our sin. Isaiah 53, 4, Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Jesus heads for Golgotha. It means skull. The mountain kind of resembles a skull. Jan wasn't there, and, and Jeanette were both there not long ago, and they saw it. I'm sure 2,000 years ago it might have been a little more pronounced than what it is now. But each step, Jesus is getting closer to making the final sacrifice. Each step that He takes, He loses more blood. His very life is slipping away. But He still has to go through the suffering of crucifixion. A beam is laid on the ground and Jesus is thrown backward with His shoulders against the wood. The Roman soldier feels for the depression in the front of the wrist and drives a heavy spike through the wrist and deep into the wood. He moves quickly to the other side and does the same to the other hand. The left foot is then pressed back against the right foot and with both feet extended downward, a nail is driven through the arch of each. He pushes himself up to avoid the stretching torment so he would place his weight on the nail through his feet. Without being able to raise up, he'd have no way to get any air into his lungs. Jesus will fight just to raise himself up for one short breath. Hours of limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint-rending cramps, partial asphyxi asphyxiation, Incredible pain as the tissues on his lacerated back push up and down against that rough wood. Jesus suffered when he was on the cross. Suffered many things besides just physical pain. The Bible says that he hung on the cross between two thieves. And of course, people were on the ground hurling insults at them, mocking Him. And even the Bible says the thieves cast the same in His teeth. They too taunted Him. People who just a few days earlier were shouting Hosanna. Blessed is He that cometh in the name of the Lord are now hurling insults at Him. 
The religious leaders were mocking him among themselves. It is interesting in verse 42 what they said about Jesus, isn't it? He saved others. I'm not sure they ever admitted that till now. But he sure did save others. And now they even had to admit that. Years ago, I heard Dr. Henniger, the pastor I grew up under, and he preached a message on this passage, and I never forgot it. He said, there's a truth a half-truth, and a lie. It's true, He saved others. It's a half-truth when you say, Himself He cannot save. Oh, He could have. She just sang, He could have called. Jesus said 12 legions of angels. 12 legions or 10,000, it would have got the job done, amen? So that's a half-truth. And then when they said, If He be the King of Israel, let Him now come down from the cross and we'll believe Him. That's an outright lie. He did more than come down from the cross. He arose from the dead. <laughs> and they wouldn't believe on Him. It's amazing, isn't it, that religious leaders would admit that He saved others and yet they won't bow the knee to Him. It's a, it's, a, it's a stark reminder to those of you who don't know Christ as your Savior. Make sure you know Him. Don't think that, well, you know, if I'm not saved and the rapture happens, buddy, I'll be the first one at church to the altar. Can I help you with that? You won't be. In the book of Revelation, even during the tribulation period, the Bible talks about men who who know it's God and God is having the mountains and the, the crumble on them and the earthquake and, and they shake their fist at God when you think they'd fall on their knees to God. But they won't. Finally, one of the thieves, Luke tells the story that one of the malefactors began to rebuke the other and said, Don't, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. That's when he asked the Lord to remember him. When he comes into his kingdom. You're looking at a fella who's a bloody mess Isaiah tells us his visage his appearance was so marred you could not tell it was a human being and this fella on the cross recognizes he's a king he's the savior and ask him for mercy Jesus was not, as the songwriter said, as she sang tonight, He was not pleading for mercy. He was not begging for anyone to help. He wasn't on the cross pleading with people. He wasn't on the cross defending His innocence. He didn't shout out that this is all wrong. He went to the cross for our sins. And He knew why He went to the cross. He suffered the loss of his earthly possession while he was on the cross. You read about it in Matthew. John writes it this way. John said the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, let us not rend it but cast lots for it whose it shall be, that the Scripture might be fulfilled which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. These men had no idea they were fulfilling Scripture, but they were. By law, Roman soldiers were allowed to have the garment of the condemned. There were four soldiers who were in charge of the crucifixion, and they would get to divide Jesus' earthly possessions among themselves. 
Jesus didn't have any earthly possessions except the clothes that He had on. And He watched those be divided and gambled away. That outer vesture, that outer garment, that tunic was the grand prize since it was a one-piece tunic. He also suffered the loss of the only family He had on the cross. His mom watched. And she was placed into the care of John. Finally, gathering all the strength He has, Jesus pushes up one last time to get enough breath in His lungs. The tissues tearing and the pain searing through His body to say, Father, into Your hands I commend My Spirit. And He gave up the ghost. To make double sure that He was dead, the soldiers took a spear. They drove it under his ribs, up into his heart. And the Bible says there came out blood and water. How can you, how can you understand what Jesus Christ went through and think you'll go to heaven by being good? How can we think we'll go to heaven because I'm religious? Or I go to church? Are there some other way when Jesus went through that for us? Christ died for us. If Jesus did that for me, do I love Him enough to live for Him? Can I I think lightly of sin when I see what it did to the Lord Jesus? Could I not tell others what He has done for them so they too could have eternal life? The songwriter, I think, had it right when he said, I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? Brother Bob, I want Bob to sing a song for you. We may sing the chorus with him. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. Listen carefully as he sings these words tonight. Ask God to speak to your heart. I was guilty with nothing to say and they were coming to take me away but then a voice from heaven was heard that said let him go take me instead but i should have been crucified i should have suffered and died i should have hung on the cross in disgrace but jesus god's son took my place that crown of thorns the spear deep in his side and the pain 
It should have been mine. Those rusty nails, they were meant for me. But yet Christ took them, and he let me go free. And I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross. In this grace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place, and I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place. Let's all stand together. Uh, let's sing Amazing Grace, Bob. Stand together. Let's sing Amazing Grace to close us out, all right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. said? Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad I came tonight. Uh, glad you were here too, and uh, been good to be in the house of the Lord, hasn't it? Listen, reminder, Sunday, uh, regular schedule, 9.30, 10.30 in the morning, then 6 o'clock Sunday night. How many have somebody going to come Sunday night to the cantata? You got some people coming? Good, good. And I uh, hope we have a good crowd here Sunday evening. It's going to be wonderful, and uh, they've been working hard. Uh, folks, been a lot of a lot of practice hours into this and uh they'll be practicing again tonight and again about four hours on saturday uh getting ready for sunday evening the miracle i've seen it'll be great and uh good wednesday to you and uh let's pray together father thank you for this evening thank you lord for loving us and thank you for the death of your son on the cross lord it's helped us tonight and I pray that each of us would walk out of here with a deeper love and appreciation for so great salvation that you provided for us through Jesus Christ. Now, Father, be with us as we go our separate ways now. God, make us mindful you go with us. Bless the practice this evening. Lord, bless the choir, the instrumentalist, everyone as they prepare for the cantata Sunday evening. May you minister to our hearts through that, and we'll thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.